Live from CUBE headquarters in Palo Alto, California, it's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hey, welcome everyone to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. Here, December 16th, I'm John Furrier, this is the Silicon Valley Friday Show. Uh, with me, John Furrier, we have no guests in the studio, they're probably out getting their holiday shopping. A lot of folks uh, in and around town, running around, certainly in Silicon Valley. Uh, weather was brutal, traffic's bad, as always. But uh, <clears throat> we have two great call-in guests we're going to have. Uh, Doug Gorlay, former Cisco uh, executive, Arista Networks executive, entrepreneur, and tech luminary. Also, we're going to have Jim Long, who is the father of video streaming, invented the term and the concept uh, out of Cal Berkeley. He's going to join in, he's been through, been a VC, he's been an entrepreneur, and he just launched a, a new startup that's going to be changing the cord cutting business and hopefully doing great. Again, this is the Silicon Valley Friday show where we talk about all the latest in tech, what's impacting the world out of Silicon Valley and, and around the world. I'm John Furrier. Biggest story of the of the week and probably of the back end of the year is Donald Trump winning the election. President-elect Donald Trump totally trolled everyone during the election and continues to troll everyone post-election and, and pre-elect president. And he had all the tech leaders from the top tech companies in New York at Trump Towers this week, sitting around a table um, talking about what he's going to do for tech. And that was the biggest story of the week. And I got to say that there was a noticeable posturing. They published a seating chart. The seating chart was interesting in and of itself, but what was most interesting was who was there and who wasn't there. Um, the seating chart was, uh, was, was filled with all the tech leaders you can think of. Um, you know, Peter Thiel, obviously his right-hand man, obviously stood up in the convention and supported him. Tim Cook, uh, Apple CEO, Safra Katz, CEO of Oracle, Elon Musk, Sheryl Sandberg, not Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, which we'll talk about that, Larry Page, Jeff Bezos, Brad Smith, uh, who's with Microsoft, uh, chief legal officer, um, and then you had... Um, Brian from C uh, from CEO of Intel, Eric Schmidt, uh, and then you had uh, Chuck Robbins, Ginny Rametti, Satya Nutella, all the top people, but who wasn't there was the Twitter CEO, Jack Dorsey, who was not invited. He was purposely blackballed from the meeting because of his war with Trump on Emojigate, I call. And basically Emojigate is they essentially uh, tried to get it through a $5 million ad buy during the first debate. They wanted to have an emoji on uh, the hashtag Crooked Hillary, which showed a person running with a bag of money. Twitter out, rejected it out of hand editorially, and that caused Trump to be pissed off. And then now, hence, Twitter is blackballed from that little circle of tech stars. So that was interesting. Uh, what was also interesting was Mark Zuckerberg didn't show up. Sheryl Sandberg showed up. And a lot of people are talking about that because Sheryl has political background. So for her to be there, she is very strong in policy, very savvy. Some say she might run for president someday. So she was there. And, and, and they really didn't look like they were having a good time. And certainly Trump was owning them and essentially making them come to New York, kiss the ring, as some say. But ultimately, a lot of people in the press were, were really kind of dissing on, on the, the tech ex execs for that. Here's my take. Trump is owning the tech people by making them come down and groveling for attention because if they don't come down, they might not get the huge benefits from the Trump administration when he puts it on the table that he's going to bring all that cash that's overseas. And let me be specific. Of the seating chart, if you look at the seating chart, the people with the most cash outside the U.S. were closest to Trump. You had Tim Cook, you had um, Larry Page, and you had Oracle. And just to kind of put it in perspective, um, the top five tech companies with cash outside the U.S., some of these companies have over 80 to 90% of their cash on hand for their entire business outside the U.S. because under former uh, President Obama and others, the tax rate to bring it back in was so high, they're better off leaving it over there and then taking debt out on the cash and the repayment interest is still less than bringing the cash in because of the tax. This is trillions and trillions of dollars that are sitting outside the country. So that's why, in my opinion, that's why everyone was there. They were there because Trump might throw the switch not for a tax holiday, just to bring it all back all the time. So here's the numbers. Apple, number one company with uh, over $175 billion overseas. $175 billion overseas. Number two, Microsoft, greater than $100 billion outside the U.S. Three, IBM, greater than $70 billion. Google, now called Alphabet, greater than $60 billion. 
Cisco at number five with 55 billion plus and Oracle with 45 billion. All of those people were in the room. So if you're Apple, just think about that. Close to $200 billion of cash is outside the U.S. So Tim Cook was frowning, probably taking it on the chin, but ultimately this, they have to do that. The, the, the shareholders want to probably see that cash come in. So to me, I think that is the reason why everyone was there. And then the big surprise is Safra Katz, CEO of Oracle, announced that she's going to be on the transition team for Trump. So you have this kind of... People are starting to come out of the closet now in Silicon Valley around Trump. So you're starting to see who actually is supporting Trump. Are they being political or are they just being more from the party of business, as I say I'm from, which is whoever's in, whoever helps business, I like. And I think that's kind of an interesting dynamic. The problem is, is that anyone could have beat Hillary and Trump happens to be the guy. So I think Trump, everyone got it all wrong about Trump. He's going to put together a cabinet. He's going to do well, in my opinion. I think you're going to start to see people kind of take back what they've been saying. So I think we're going to be watching this really, really closely. Is anybody yeah. not smiling? A lot of people, not? I mean, Sheryl Sandberg was biting her lip. You can see a picture there. Uh, Tim Cook looked very glum. Bezos was pretty upbeat, and that was surprising because he had a war of words with Trump because he owns the Washington Post and he has political feelings. But I think ultimately people are going to put their differences aside. At the end of the day, business has still got to run. He's the president. Uh, Bezos was very supportive. But I think there's still an undercurrent of hate for Trump. And I think that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and I, again, Trump is probably going to surprise everybody. But the question is, can he align with tech? Will he destroy tech? Will he destroy net neutrality? And the on and on. So we're going to be watching that closely. Everyone kind of got it wrong to begin with. We'll see. Um, other top stories this week, Yahoo got hacked and again, and the numbers are over a billion users were uh, revealed. Then and on the black market, it's going for $300,000 for, for that list. Oracle had earnings down uh, a bit from what people expected. Cisco won a big trial jury against Cisco, and our, our first guest will be Doug Gourlay, who's going to come on and talk about uh, that and among other things. So again, end of the year, last show for us. We're going to get right into it. So let's, uh, let's get to Doug Gourlay on the line first, and then we'll go to Jim Long. So let's get Doug. Here we go. Calling. All right. So Doug Gourlay, I've known for years. Um, and uh, Doug, John Furrier, good to talk to you. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Friday show. <laughs> good morning. It's good to be on your show, John. We're, we're live and the new call-in feature. So we get, you know, call the iPhones. Works, works like a champ. How are you? Wow. Happy really birthday, by the way. It's, <laughs> it's, it's your birthday, so happy birthday. Thanks, John. I, I was like, is this this prank calling thing that your friends organize on your birthday? <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> we got so the dirt on you. First call. Can you put up those naked yeah, photos of Doug right now? Come on, put them up. <laughs> um, well, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time. I know you got to run out at uh, and and get in the car, but I want to just chat and see what you're up to. And you know, obviously, good timing. One, your birthday. Two. Uh, you got a great commentary. We've known each other way back when you were at Cisco, really working on the core routers and switches back in the old days at Arista Networks, and now you know, as an entrepreneur and tech luminary, you've seen a few things. So first, I got to ask you: Arista wins a jury trial against Cisco. What's your what's happening? Well, I think that's a win for, frankly, every startup in Silicon Valley, especially one in the networking space. Um, to me, as much as, you know, I mean, I, I love Cisco and I love my time there and a lot of my good friends are still there, but this was an example of a big company being upset that a startup came in and was taking market share. You know, if it was Cisco upset that somebody was using the same CLI as them, we would have seen the exact same lawsuit against Boundary, Extreme, Brocade, and everybody else. And if it was about the intellectual property of private VLANs, we would have seen lawsuits against Broadcom and every other semiconductor manufacturer and every other switching vendor. So what it was clearly was about somebody taking market share, and that upset Cisco, and they resorted to litigation to solve that. What's and the they, relevance? That's, What's that's the relevance exactly of that? What, what does that mean for the marketplace? What's it mean for the... That stymies innovation. So what? the jury saying Arista was innocent, you know, and did not violate the copyrights of Cisco and that the CLI was an industry standard CLI with a standard piece of, it's like a movie scene where it opens up into you know, the kitchen and the family's having breakfast and you see that scene again and again because it's used in seven different movies. 
doesn't mean that it's uh, it's copyrighted by one of them. So that to, that to me is a win for Silicon Valley because it means that companies can enter the market, they can compete, they can create products that are easy for customers to use. And to me, that's the most important thing. If I can build a product that is easy for a customer to absorb and use and to bring into their plant, and I can reduce that barrier of entry, what I'm doing is I'm creating the ability for my customers to have more choice, whether that choice is my product or somebody else's. It levels that playing field a little bit. And I think that's good for everybody, and most importantly, it's good for the consumer. So what's your take on the current landscape? Obviously, cloud computing shaking things up. Cisco is talked as being one of the ones like HPE. Maybe can they pivot in time? they got a new CEO who happened to be sitting down with Trump this week. So that's interesting. What's, what's your take on the landscape right now? It's the end of the year. People are saying, hey, thank God 2016 is over. They're looking to 2017. Is it going to get any better? I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, probably some opportunities to take. But if you're a big incumbent like a Cisco or an HPE and these Oracle, they got to be shaking in their boots. Your thoughts on what's happening? Well, two thoughts on that, John. Uh, the first is it's a kind of two macro trends I see. Uh, the first is clearly, and I think everybody will stand at you know, the cloud, the cloud, the cloud, right? I went to this AWS show this year. I tried to meet with you, and there were 32,000 people there competing you know, to try to get in to talk to John, right? So it's like, oh, my God, this is incredible. Um, it's the fact that there are 32,000 people there who's – like stated interest is to never buy a piece of equipment that I've manufactured before in my life. Like literally, I spent 20 years building network equipment, and there's more buyers at the Amazon reInvent show whose goal was to not buy anything I've ever made before, <laughs> I've ever seen before. I'm like, whoa. Oh, that's, that's a holy shit deal. moment right there. Right? So what does that mean? That means tremendous uh, demand-side consolidation into a small number of incredibly powerful buying centers. Amazon, Azure, Google, Facebook, and so on. And frankly, if you're an infrastructure manufacturer supporting data center operations in any capacity and you are not selling to those companies today, I firmly believe you will be out of business in three to five years. Wow. The second, mac the second macro trend, though, is the 2016 election. Right, we have a, you know, this is like anathema in Silicon Valley to say, you know, and I'm an eternal optimist, right? That's why I'm in marketing and product management and sales and everything else. And I'm not in like the pragmatic portions of the business. But you look at what happened and I go, okay, well, we have an incredibly, at least stated, pro business president elect. If he does, you know, I see these big meetings and what's likely to happen is a reduction of the, of the business tax rate. And I believe also the, you know, and, an attempt at reducing the tax rate for the repatriation of outside capital, of capital that's currently housed in countries outside the U.S., where companies like Cisco had $20, $30 billion offshore, Oracle, Microsoft, Apple, and so on. We just went down and that list. Cisco's see, over $60 billion overseas. Right. If you see that much outside capital, if they say – if the administration does something that allows them to repatriate it at a minimal tax rate, we're going to see all of a sudden, you know, let's say Cisco has $10 billion sitting there. What are they going to do with that? Well, there's only a few options. You cut a huge dividend check. Okay. I mean, as a shareholder, people appreciate that. You do a big stock buyback. Shareholders are less happy with stock buybacks than they are with uh, dividends. Or you do M&A. M&A. Yes. And Love that. If it's M&A, which I believe is one of the more likely outcomes of a repatriation of foreign capital, what we're going to see is one of the biggest tech acquisition cycles. As these big companies say, hey, this cloud thing's happening, I need to repool my product mix to embrace that. And a lot of companies, we watched Cisco, for instance, make a lot of acquisitions that were in Europe, like Tanberg and such, largely in a way to deploy that foreign capital. I think we'll see yeah. those types of acquisitions of small to mid-sized companies happening domestically. And if there's competition for it, it could be one of the bigger tech buying cycles we've ever experienced. Well, that'd be, and I think that's, I think you're right on the money. And we're here, Doug Gourlay, who's an uh, entrepreneur, tech exec, been, been in the business for a long time, seen many cycles of innovation, talking about the boom of M&A, which I, would, I totally see that coming because uh, dividends are nice and, and, and they're kind of you know, uh, a gesture. Stock buybacks is financial engineering, but at the end of the day, if you're under the gun of potentially going out of business that the cloud could do, you have to fill the product lines, gas 
adapts and also reboot and refresh uh, technology cycle. So totally great observation. I agree with you. And that's a great comment. Doug, question for you. What are you hearing on the streets of Silicon Valley? What's in the, what's going on in the coffee shops? What's going on in the bars? What's happening with the entrepreneurs? What's the whisper? What are you hearing out there? What's the talk of the town? What's the top things that people care about? Entrepreneurs, tech executives, what's the buzz? Uh, I, I'll tell you, I was sitting in, uh, Cafe Venezia uh, two days ago in Palo Alto on University Avenue, talking to an entrepreneur who has an interesting product. They're you know three to four engineers working on it themselves, and then you know looking for their seed capital round. Uh, two tables down was another guy talking about hiring systems engineers. Behind me is another guy you know pitching somebody on his business plan. Um, <laughs> it's. Uh, there's certainly a fervor, right? There's an energy level, and it's not downer. It's not a downer situation. People are upbeat. There's some action. So you know these cycles when you have these troughs and changes, that's an entrepreneurial opportunity. That's when you should be yeah. gearing up, right? Exactly, exactly. And there's a competition. Honestly, if there's one trend I'm seeing that you know comes out of that, it's a competition for talent, right? And one of the one of the hardest jobs. I'm finding to place into a company I'm talking to or working with is like that VP of product, right? And, and the, you know, the, the reason is if you take a, a person who's really good at product, really good at cost, understanding and working with customers, who's able to really deeply relate to engineering, and what they're like, well, I could take a VP of product role, well, why don't I just go start my own thing? Or why don't I go take a CEO spot? And so that's becoming a really complicated, hard find is an yeah. experienced head of product. Product, and again, yes. I mean, I've talked to three or four companies where finding that person who, you know, especially when you have an engineering-led, engineering-founded company that got their first four to ten people, they've got their product idea, they're working the concept out, and they're trying to get it down and get it tight and work with, you know, get their initial customer engagements. Finding the person to lead that function at some of these companies is an incredibly difficult um, search, frankly. Yeah, that's and totally right. The product led CEO, to too, has been a big trend as well. Product led, engineering led. Certainly, when you got the cloud capabilities, you can actually have you know instant resource pools available. So that really favors the technical engineering folks who have a business mindset, yeah. uh, whether you're a front end developer or back end developer, you can really do some damage. Well, it's a company I was talking to two days ago showed me their architecture, and they're like, hey, I'm like, this is really cool. And they're like, yeah, we're going to build these two hosting data centers out. I'm like, whoa, 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 stop for a second. You're going to do what? I'm like, guys, do you realize you could put this in Azure or Amazon, and you're going to save $5 million of CapEx. You're going to save $1.4 million a year in OpEx and not having to have a web team. Uh, web ops team, a site reliability engineering team. And then on top of that, let's look at the list of regulatory compliance things you're going to have to comply with if you build it yourself. This will consume your current engineering team for the next three years. We can inherit the majority of these just by deploying one of these infrastructures. Yeah, what, what cloud has done is reduce the barrier to entry uh, initially for a lot of consumer-facing businesses, but increasingly with the level of regulatory compliance and interesting network features like direct path and things like that, they let it really reduce the barrier to entry yeah. for enterprise companies as well. I think I think it's I think we're going to see conventional wisdom uh, really being debunked across the board. We're going to see so many new ideas that's going to change. Uh, people's thinking of things, and you, as you were saying, you were you, you had a career in building product. Now it's gone, right? So this is a lot of action. Doug Gourlay joining us. Thanks so much for taking the time, Doug. What are you up to these days? You're advising startups. What's what's going on in your world? Yeah, advising uh, three or four companies. So uh, you know, one in the network abstraction and intent-based networking space. Another one in the IoT security space. Working with another one in the container space around container networking and container security. Uh, and a handful of others. It's uh, When you look at the problems that need to be solved next, we've seen the application developer become one of the prime insertion points of new technology into the enterprise. And that app developer you know, is now moving to containers as one of their primary vehicles for deploying applications, and therefore the underlying infrastructure needs to be container-aware. That becomes a big shift for a lot yeah. of people. And we just had... I was just time, like, if you look, look at uh, IoT, John, I mean, yeah. you go into a hospital... There are billions of dollars of companies designed to secure laptops, servers, and mobile phones. Yep. But 80% of the devices inside of a hospital are not laptops, mobile phones, 
for servers. All right, Doug, final question for, for you. Monitors, fi- final, final question for you. Who has coal in their stockings this year in the tech business, and who has the goods? Who's, uh, who's going to open up their gifts and see coal, and who's going to have coal in their stocking? Who's going to have the Who's going to have the goods? <laughs> well, um, I got to tell you, I I've been waiting for somebody to do the uh, the buyout of Brocade for a long time, and I'm not surprised to see that happen. Um, you know, it was so cash rich on the fan side, and so investment heavy, and low returns on the IP side. That you know, I don't know whether the deal is good for the employees, but I think it's good for the acquirer certainly, and uh, you know, I hope Broadcom figures a way up to, to navigate that without infuriating their OEMs. Um, <laughs> there are other semiconductor customers. I'm sure they will. The um, so that that's an interesting deal that's going to you know play out well for people. You know, a company that I still you know strongly believe in is Palo Alto Networks. You know, I look yeah. at them and I see a company that has the mass to survive any economic disruption, um, and has a tremendous customer base. And really, like with their traps product moved into endpoint. Struggled a little bit at first, and really came to came to bear smoothly, and is uh, is crushing it. And they so, got the founder still around too. And we see the founder led company still still a founder led company too, which is great. You got the technical founder there, so um, good yeah, stuff. Near is an incredible visionary in the security space, yeah. and a top flight management team across the board. Doug, happy and birthday clearly, today! Happy birthday to you! Um, have happy a, to have that verdict. Have a great day on your birthday. Appreciate it, and uh, thanks for thanks for taking the time. Thanks so much, Sean. You guys right. have a great one over there as take, well. Take care. Doug Gourlay, executive tech luminary. Great commentary. I mean, guys, you heard what he said. Big M&A boom coming. If, as we were saying on the Trump opening, there's that cash sitting out there. He reinforced that. Basically, that's the deal. And this is what's going on. I mean, put your politics aside. It's going to be raining money in the U.S. That's what's happening. That is why people are snapping the line. Everyone else is kind of like, oh, bum, because Obama's not in there, and some of the Silicon Valley folks are going to be bummed that, that uh, uh, yeah, Trump won. But still, you know, if people have cash in their pocket, people have a spring in their step. So that's why, what I always say. Um, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with Jim Long right after the short break. Get more commentary on the phone. We crank call all the execs and people in the industry get their thoughts here on the Silicon Valley Friday show with John Furrier. Be right back. Since the dawn of big data, the cube has been there. Connecting with executives, practitioners, entrepreneurs, thought leaders. But you're not a thought leader anymore. You're a futurist. That's the new trend. Futurist is the buzzword. No, I'm not. I'm I'm very much living in the past. I don't like the future. I don't think much of the present. John Cleese. There's a lot of people out there who have no idea what they're doing, but they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. And those are the ones with the confidence of stupidity who finish up in power. That's why the planet doesn't work. Knowledgeable, insightful, and a true gentleman. And the guy at the counter recognized me and said, Are you listening? Yes, I'm tweeting away. So not, I tweet. I'm tweeting away. He just got rude that way. But. F***ing keyboard. <laughs> John Cleese joins the Cube alumni. Welcome, John. You got any phone calls you need to answer? Hold on. Let me check. The Cube is a comfortable place. You come inside the Cube and we have a conversation. Uh, almost as if it were a, a, a chance meeting. And we have a, a discussion about a particular topic. Our philosophy is everybody's expert at something. Everybody's passionate about something and has real deep knowledge about that something. Well, we want to focus in on that area and extract that knowledge and share it with our communities. Folks who have never heard of it before come in the Cube and say, wow, this is really cool what you guys are doing. It's unique. It adds value to the community. It adds value by really sharing information. I can't tell you how many people stop me at conferences or on the streets, on our airports, say, hey, I love your show. People that I've never met before, they say to me, I know you, you don't know me. I watch the Cube, I queue up your videos, I listen to them while I'm on the, the treadmill. You know, it helps me, you know, learn, expands my knowledge, you know, thank you. So, you know, it's really an honor to be part of that community. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. December 16th, we are here wrapping up the, the year. We're going to not be on, uh, on, on the next two weeks. We're going to be on vacation. 
Joining me right now on the phone is Jim Long, uh, industry legend, uh, father of streaming, invented the concept of streaming as we know it, Berkeley Cal guy, he's biased towards Cal, which is cool, but a uh, friend, entrepreneur as well, former venture capitalist. Back when venture capital was like three firms, Jim, thanks for uh, coming on the line. Appreciate uh, you taking the time. Happy to be in, with you, John, here on the Cube or Cube Radio. Silicon Valley <laughs> Friday show. This is the this Cube's a little Got bit different. It. It's more edgier than the Cube. We go we go edgy here on the my Friday podcast. Edgy, okay. Which is why we have you on because you're edgy. Hey, so Jim, you know <laughs> we know you know the folks. We Jim, I've known Jim for a long time. He's a, a good friend, but more importantly, he's been at the center of. Uh, all the computer revolution at you know going back to Cal when you were uh, studying uh, uh, with uh, in Cal when all the systems revolution happened all the you know anti Unix systems building out Linux as it becomes today really started at the kernel at Cal and Northeastern MIT the schools Carnegie Mellon and things of that nature but you have you know you invented streaming coined the term you call, called the father of streaming video streaming which we're doing right now um but also you and worked with you know fred adler some of the early venture capitalists like jim anderson uh and then now john Doerr was just a young guy coming in you knew those guys so you've seen the evolution of venture capital you've seen the evolution of entrepreneurship over multiple cycles of innovation what's your thoughts what's going on right now in your mind what is the current state of entrepreneurship in silicon valley yeah, well, uh, great topic. Uh, f uh, first of all, two things to point out. One is, of course, uh, the whole streaming thing was done by a big team. I, it was my original idea, uh, but it was sort of, you know, vi vi vision is just seeing the obvious for the next guy, so I'm, I'm glad I got ahead on that one. Uh, and um, the other thing to point out is that, uh, you know, the entrepreneurship stuff is strong for sure, uh, but it's really tied to the overall economy. And I think what we've seen the last six, seven years um, is, a, you know, a government that is really not helping the economy. Uh, and we're in for a period now where uh, it could get worse or better. It's just too early to say um, with the new Trump administration. And I think we I think the economy itself it's so resilient, you know, thank goodness, you know, despite how dysfunctional our government is, the economy itself is what's powering things forward. I, I certainly give Obama some credit for not screwing it up, but the president can't really do a whole lot. It really comes down to Congress, and they need to get their act together. You know, there's multiple things that need to be done at the same time, tax reform, Entitlement reform, certainly uh, smart regulations, things like that. You can't just pick one of them off or the other one off. You can't, like, you know, have hard and fast rules. I mean, I, you know, for example, he, they nominated people in the immigration area that are still questioning H-1B visas. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> That's uh, true. You know, for 250 years, this country has been driven by immigrants starting businesses. How do you, you know, do you really want the best and brightest immigrants to come over here for education to go start businesses elsewhere? I mean, it makes no sense. Now, obviously, people abuse it, and that's, that's an issue. But, you know, it, it, I, I, it's amazing that we're starting off this new administration still arguing about <clears throat> whether or not we should have more H-1B visas for uh, our most talented you know, uh, U.S. educated immigrants. So, yeah, I, I totally mean, agree with you on uh, that one. To me, that's the big issue for entrepreneurship. You know, I don't think, uh, I think it's fun. That's what's going on here with all the new technologies. I was involved with neural networks in the 80s. It's fun to see them come back now as the new AI. I think there's a lot of promise there. Yeah. Um, personally, I believe there's more hype than promise, but I think it's, it's all good. Well, it's got more. Uh, so it's got I, more meat I, on the bone than it ahead. did years ago. Certainly, the, with cloud computing and software, you can now start taking those known concepts and neural networks and AI and start putting some, you know, and baby steps with products. No, absolutely. So, no, absolutely. I mean, I have, uh, I'm running a cloud business to consumer apps company now, and uh, uh, you know, I, uh, once we get the basics out of the way, I'm looking forward to seeing what we could do with uh, you know the new Amazon AI stuff or. Or perhaps uh, the stuff that Google or Facebook is doing as well. But you're right. You know, when you can just make API calls over the cloud and get expert systems and uh, and you know uh, semi-smart bot 
technology working for you without writing a lot of code. That's pretty darn cool. We're here with Jim Long, a CEO of a couple of companies, also an, an entrepreneur, also an investor uh, as well um, here on the Silicon Valley Friday show. Um, as we round out the year, you got to look at that Trump uh, meeting with the tech executives. And I put the, the seating chart on Facebook and commentary is pretty funny, but you know, there's a lot of billions, trillions of dollars out there in cash outside the U.S., so that's you know probably one of the reasons why they went there. I mean, why else would Tim Cook and Bezos go to this meeting? I mean, people in Silicon Valley were like, you know, boycotted. They couldn't get it to do it. There's too much greed on the table. But I mean, what's your what's your take of that whole meeting? Sideshow? I mean, Trump saying, I, I gave you a well, bounce? I mean, come on. Trump I mean, gave Trump, him a bounce? Trump makes it a sideshow, but that, you know, he's the president-elect. Uh, I think you got to go. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, business tax reform makes a lot of sense, but, but on the other hand, you gotta do full tax reform and, and you can't certainly give the rich, you know, bigger tax breaks. <clears throat> this notion that, you know, trickle down economics, it doesn't work. It's proven, right? It really, the big issue we have is the declining middle class <clears throat> and the fact that it's harder for our kids to be successful than it was for us. First time in a long, long time, if ever, in the United States that that's happening. Yeah. And that's the big problem. And, and, and I, I certainly didn't see anything from Trump or Hillary that really addressed that issue, which is a, it's a complicated issue, but it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a Gordian knot. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, if you go back to Obama and John Boehner arguing about the grand bargain, we need a grand bargain here. Yeah. We can't just say, you know, slash taxes or stop immigration or, you know, let's go pump you know, drill baby, drill oil or something. It's yeah. really, it's, it's, it's a solvable problem, but not if you take it a piece at a time. And I think, I think the fact is that it's good that tech people are involved there. <clears throat> but uh, if, if any of those folks think that they have their own individual selfish notions um, that somehow are going to get assuaged, then, then we're in trouble because really it's an economic countrywide problem. Yeah. <clears throat> and if we solve that properly, Jim. Uh, tech will flourish, uh, and, and if we don't, tech will do fine, but 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 the it won't flourish as much. Okay, so I want to ask you about, you know, we got a couple minutes left. I want to get your final thoughts on uh, the topic of the year, which for the end of closing out our Silicon Valley Friday show for the year. Uh, state of venture capital, obviously, you know, I said on the intro, you've been around when it was a handful of firms. Arthur Rocks of the world were around. Jim Anderson, legend. Um, Fred Adler, who you worked with. You know, even back then, John Doerr was just a young associate. And, and then now venture capital is, is, is completely changed. But that's been the engine of innovation in Silicon Valley is the venture capital and entrepreneurship relationship, the ecosystem of support and, and, and support systems. What's your thoughts? What's changed? What's good, bad, and ugly about venture? Is it still the same game, different? Uh, look and feel thoughts on uh, you know the the venture capital. Obviously, people talk about the, the asset class. Sure. You know, what's your thoughts? Well, well, I think actually we're coming into a nice period. I think we were leaving an overhyped period, right? We had not only way too much seed investing because they loosened the rules on rules on angel investing, and too many companies got early funding and then couldn't get you know these a follow on from a, their seed. We also had the you know, the unicorn hype, which sucked money out of uh, secondary venture capital to follow, you know, the primary venture capitalists. And that, you know, didn't work out so well for a lot of people. Obviously, some people it did. Uh, and also, you know, the China bubble has, has uh, popped a bit. So um, I think what that means is you're seeing a shuffling a little bit of investors. I mean, you still have the, the big dogs on Sand Hill Road chasing the most glamorous deals and, you know, AI drones and consumer deals that have a billion users, even if they don't have a business model and, and you know, self-driving cars and uh, I IoT and all those things. But I think my guess is, from what I can tell, is the preponderance of, the, of venture people, you know, not the leaders on Sand Hill Road, but folks across the country and other places are starting to get a little bit more back to meat and potatoes, <clears throat> which is, does this really solve a problem? Is this really going to have profits? anytime soon um and they're 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 looking beyond the you know the sand hill folks yeah. uh for investments um and and so i think that's good too so you're seeing more instead of i i would guess i would say a less lemming effect and more um spread real, out Maybe real entrepreneurship in some respects but but i think that's good for the the venture biz great and uh thanks so much for the commentary quick question final point if you can be quick 
who's got coal in their stocking this Christmas and who's got gifts? If you had to look out the landscape <laughs> of technology, who's got the coal? Who's going to be, you know, who's naughty, who's nice? Who's the, who? Give us your take real quick. Oh, geez. You know, I'll tell you right now for sure, uh, um, I, I do think uh, Facebook is going to continue to be in the, the catbird seat uh, overall. Uh, and I think uh, be a bit, uh, I'd still be a bit careful about some of the overhyped things like VR and AR and things like that. Obviously, business is to be built there, but boy, that's it's not going to be as easy as people think. All right, Jim Long here on the Silicon Valley Friday Show. Jim, thanks for uh, taking the time out of your busy day. Have a great holiday, great chat, and a great commentary. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, John. You too. Okay, that's the Silicon Valley Friday Show uh, with John Foyer. Wrapping up the year, and again, more great stuff next year. We're going to have uh, every week. Uh, every Friday, we're going to have a show. Uh, we're going to continue the momentum, continue to evolve the That's format. We're going to bring guests in, call them up, have them in studio here in Palo Alto. But the goal is, in Palo Alto, in Silicon Valley, bringing you the best action here at the Silicon Valley Friday Show uh, in SiliconANGLE's office in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for listening, and have a great, happy new year. 